Thanks for that. Um, so my name is Cora Kemmeyer, and I am a researcher at the Pacific Institute, which is a water sustainability focused nonprofit. I'll go into some more detail about both myself and the institute. Um, but first, just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about. So um, the topic is water in cities, right? And so I'll give some introductions. I'll talk about the global water crisis and how it interfaces with climate change. Um, I'll highlight a project that we are working on, the Pacific Institute, around sustainable urban landscapes. Uh, and then I'll kind of just preview some urban sustainability water solutions uh, around the world. Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion. All right, so my name is Cora Kammeyer. Uh, I've been at the Pacific Institute as a researcher for about two years. Uh, prior to the Institute, I was at the Nature Conservancy and also worked for a startup called Water Smart Software. That's a water conservation focused startup based here in San Francisco. So the Pacific Institute, our mission is to create and advance solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. And we envision a society or a world in which society, the economy, and the environment have the water they need to thrive now and into the future. We're a relatively small organization. We were founded about 30 years ago. Uh, with an annual budget of three million and a staff of about 25. But we are global in scope uh, with staff across five countries and four continents um, and work on both issues here in California and issues globally. Uh, so we work on a broad array of water issues. These are our focus areas. So climate and water, corporate water stewardship, healthy aquatic systems, safe and affordable water, sustainable agriculture, and of course, water smart cities. Uh, we are really rooted in research and analysis. That is our core competency, um, and that is the basis for all of the other work and communication and engagement that we do. Uh, this is just a kind of smattering, and it might be hard to read, of the publications that we put out over the past 30 years, um, which are dozens, and so we do uh, research and formal scientific publications and white papers and also other um, collaborations and um, engagements. So now shifting to talking about the problem, the global water crisis. So today we are putting more pressure on our freshwater resources than ever before, and we're facing increasing water challenges. Those challenges vary around the world, but range from too little water, too much water, polluted water, destruction of freshwater ecosystems, failure to meet the basic human need for water and sanitation, and failing water infrastructure. Uh, water risk is increasing around the world. This is a map from the World Resources Institute. They have a water risk tool. And so this is current water risk with the dark red areas being the regions of the world facing highest water risks. And this map shows the change in water risk anticipated by 2040. So again, the red areas are where we're going to see increasing water risk, and they're in the areas that are already facing for the most part significant risks. Here are some statistics about the magnitude of the challenge. So 2.1 billion people lack access to safe drinking water, and 4.5 billion people lack access to safely managed sanitation services. Over 80% of the world's wastewater is just charged back into rivers and oceans without being treated, which causes water quality problems and public health problems. Over 60% of our ecosystems, most of which are freshwater ecosystems, are being degraded or used unsustainably. And on our current trajectory, by 2050, 5 billion people will live in areas where water demand outstrips water supply. And on the flip side, 1.6 billion people will live in areas at risk of flooding, putting $45 trillion worth of assets at risk. And what makes water issues especially challenging, but also uh, provides potential for a lot of solutions, is that water affects all other parts of society, right? Whether it's manufacturing, agriculture, fisheries, forests, power, public health, water touches everything that we do. Uh, water is also linked to almost every United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. If you're not familiar with the SDGs, they are a set of 17 global goals established by the United Nations as a kind of next generation after the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, SDG 6 is focused explicitly on clean water and sanitation, and it is tied to almost every other goal, including SDG 11, which is focused on sustainable cities. So now we've 
and learn a little bit about the global water crisis. What happens when you add climate change into the mix? Uh, so there's a common refrain in the kind of water wonk world that if climate change is a shark, water resources are the teeth. And what that means is that climate change manifests through water. Droughts, floods, heat waves, intense storms, all of these have a critical water component. And so climate change and water issues are inextricably linked. This is a graph of extreme weather events over the past 50 years. Um, and just to point out again the interlinkages with water, so they have these broken out into these three different categories, but almost all of them have water components. So storms, floods, droughts, extreme temperatures, and forest fires, and you see this increasing over the years uh, in large part because of climate change. Now, what's the role of cities in all of this? So cities land at this really critical nexus for water and climate resilience because they are facing climate change, infrastructure issues, urban population growth, and so they are both at really high risk but also have a lot of potential for solutions. Uh, a current events example you may have heard in the news about Chennai, India facing water crisis, and this is just kind of the latest water crisis that we're seeing in cities around the world, um, and just shows how cities fall in this nexus, right, where Chennai is a place that has natural water and climate volatility, and then you add uh, increasing populations, climate change, and also poor management. Um, and you see now that people are lining up to get their water that's been trucked in. Schools, hospitals, businesses are facing operational challenges because they don't have enough water. And we saw this uh, in South Africa, in Cape Town last year. We saw it in Sao Paulo, Brazil a few years ago. It's becoming increasingly common in the world's major cities. And so why is this? Why are cities so critical? So part of it is the population, right? By 2050, we expect that two-thirds of the global population will live in cities. Cities are dependent on infrastructure that is vulnerable to extreme events, like floods and like droughts. And People in cities need services and goods that depend on a sufficient supply of water. And pretty much anything we consume or use on a daily basis in an urban environment requires water. And lastly, there's a connection between water and energy that's important to remember. Providing clean water to cities requires a lot of energy. And so this infographic shows the urban water cycle uh, and these little um, lightning bolts show where energy is required for this water system, right? So you have water that's withdrawn from a river or lake, the freshwater source. It's brought to a water treatment plant where it's treated to drinking water standards. That requires energy. Then it's conveyed to people's homes and businesses, which also requires energy. And then the end uses have energy embedded, particularly if they're hot water, right? So hot showers, washing, those things that have uh, a heating aspect require energy, and it gets sent to a wastewater treatment plant, also energy intensive, before it's sent back into the environment. So it's really important when thinking about climate change to remember this water energy nexus and the energy that's embedded in the water. All right, so to recap the problem, today we're, face, we're putting more pressure on freshwater resources than ever and facing increasing water challenges. Climate change impacts largely manifest through water. And this combination of urban population growth and climbing is putting our cities at a critical nexus for water and climate resilience. So what are the solutions? As Albert Einstein famously said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Right? So we need to rethink water smart cities for the future. And in order to do that, we need to rethink water demand, water supply, and water management. And on top of that, when we're rethinking our water solutions, we must have a climate lens if we want to have climate resilient cities. And so that's both on the side of adaptation and mitigation. So for water, adaptation means preparing cities to withstand more intense droughts, heat waves, storms, and flooding. And on the mitigation side, it means reducing the energy use in greenhouse gas emissions from urban water supply, treatment, distribution, and use. So, now I'm going to shift to talking about solutions, and first I'm going to talk about this project that we're doing at the Pacific Institute. Uh, and so this is one of many projects that we're doing. This one is based in Southern California, and we're working with companies to install sustainable landscapes on commercial and industrial properties in cities 
uh, and then measuring their water sustainability and climate resilience benefits. And the reason that we're doing this is that we're seeking to shift the status quo of landscapes, especially in Southern California, from thirsty lawns and vast areas of pavement and parking lot uh, to more sustainable outdoor areas. And so coming back to this rethinking water demand, supply, and management, what this means in the context of sustainable landscapes. So for water demand, we are, in California, about 50% of all uh, urban water use goes to outdoor irrigation. And so shifting from uh, thirsty lawns or other water intensive plants to plants that are climate appropriate and native, well suited to that environment, is going to reduce water demands in cities. Uh, and at the same time, you can also think about water supplies, right? In Southern California, keeping with this example, we get water from as far as the Sierra Nevadas and the Colorado River, and those supplies are increasingly limited and less reliable. And so sustainable landscapes allow us to take advantage of local water resources. Um, through stormwater capture and reuse. And so that could mean uh, rain gardens that can capture more water in the soils and soak back into the ground to recharge groundwater aquifers, or it could mean things like rain tanks, rain barrels that can capture rainwater for reuse on the landscape. Uh, and then beyond demand and supply, looking at water management, uh, these kinds of sustainable landscapes also improve resilience to flooding and water pollution uh, because it reduces the, those impervious surfaces, the pavement I was talking about, uh, and helps to capture some of those flood flows and slow it down on the landscape uh, and also filter out some of the pollutants that would otherwise run across the pavement and back into our rivers and streams. Uh, and so we are working with the business community on this project because they're actually an often overlooked sector when it comes to water management and they own significant land within and here at the Pacific Institute, we actually have a long history of working with companies through an initiative called the CEO Water Mandate. And so I'll take it aside and tell you a little bit about the CEO Water Mandate. So this is a program that sits within the United Nations Global Compact, which is the arm of the UN that um, does corporate engagement. And so this is a platform that we essentially run for the United Nations, and it's a corporate water stewardship commitment platform which means that companies sign on to the platform to work with us and to commit to some basic tenets of food practice and water stewardship, and then work with us on projects, on developing best practice guidance, uh, cultivating resources to improve corporate water stewardship. And so businesses have varying motivations to engage in corporate water stewardship and specifically this project. Some of the common ones that we've heard from our these companies are one, uh, addressing water risks to their business, two, financial savings, um, for example, water bills, uh, three, corporate sustainability goals and the ability to meet their corporate sustainability goals, um, enhancing their reputation and public perception, and then lastly, a sense of, of social responsibility. So the great thing about sustainable landscapes uh, and many innovative water solutions is that they provide multiple benefits, even beyond water, right? And so on the left, we talked about these water benefits, reducing demand, reducing pollution and flooding, and potentially recharging the groundwater supplies. But there's other benefits from sustainable landscapes as well, such as reducing maintenance costs, creating more green space, improving community mobility, community aesthetics, and also potentially reducing energy use and greenhouse gases. Uh, and the cool thing that we are, well, I think the cool thing we're doing in this project is that we are actually able to do a geospatial analysis that lets us evaluate what regions would derive the most benefits from these sustainable landscape solutions. And so this um, was a very data intensive project, and so we focused it on a single watershed in Southern California. But what it shows is that areas where there are flood risks, the areas where there are water quality impairments, areas where the soils are, soils are suitable for groundwater recharge. Uh, and then we also did an overlay of where disadvantaged communities are in the region. And so this allows us to then use the data to prioritize what areas uh, could most benefit. This project is focused on Southern California for now, 
Uh, but it is certainly our ambition to scale it. These kinds of issues uh, exist all over the world, and we would like to work with other companies in other cities in California and around the world. Okay, so coming back to some other solutions. Um, so as I said originally, we have to rethink the way that we manage water in cities to have water smart and climate resilient cities, and that includes water demand, water supply, water management, and with a climate adaptation and mitigation lens. So I'm going to walk through some solutions, some examples um, from cities around the world who are doing innovative stuff on water, right? Who have innovative solutions. And I think it's important to remember that while cities are at great risk, we all know that cities are also hubs for innovation and new solutions, right? And so I think that this is a, a good way to see some of the great work that's being done and the potential if we scale and broaden that work to other parts of the world. And at the Pacific Institute, this is, I think, you know, something we see as part of our role is helping play this connection when we see innovations happening in one part of the world and being able to translate and bring it to another. So I'll walk through the water demand supply and management examples. So starting with water demand, right? Urban water demand be significantly reduced through conservation, which is behavioral, and efficiency, which is about optimization and technology. Um, when it comes to the adaptation and mitigation, the climate lens, right, reducing water in itself makes cities more adaptable to uncertain futures. And from the mitigation perspective, if you could focus conservation and efficiency efforts on high energy intensity water use, so particularly hot water uses, then you also get an energy. So starting in the U.S. with this example, um, just demonstrating that we in the United States have actually been able to decouple growth and water use over the past about 40 years uh, through efficiency, conservation, and shifts in economic priorities. So the graph on the top shows U.S. population and total water withdrawals, and you see that as population is steadily rising, total water withdrawals flattened out in about the mid-70s. And a similar story with U.S. GDP, which has continue to climb, uh, but water withdrawals again flattened out around the mid-70s. Uh, in Singapore is another great example of, of water conservation uh, and reduction of water demand. Singapore is an isolated island with relatively few water resources, and so they have strong incentives to be extremely efficient and um, have reduced their water use to 151 liters per day, uh, which for those of you on the metric system, that's 40 gallons per day, which compared to U.S. rates is highly efficient. Uh, and just to give you a, a sense of scale, a five-minute shower uses about 45 liters or 11 gallons. So in California, uh, this is an interesting example of water conservation and also uh, with an energy benefit. And so California was recently in a drought, as some of you probably know, um, about a five-year drought that just ended. Um, end of 2017, and during that time there was a mandate by the governor to uh, reduce water use by 25%, and Californians met and in fact exceeded that goal, um, which is an impressive reduction in a short amount of time, but an interesting uh, co-benefit that came out of that was the energy use reductions because of reduced water use, things like shortened showers, doing less laundry, and that kind of thing, and so this... Uh, reduction in water use actually ended up saving over 500,000 metric tons of, of greenhouse gas emissions, which when they did a comparison actually was more than all of the uh, water or energy utility efficiency programs during that same time. So it just goes to show that that water energy nexus is something important to keep in mind when it comes to climate. Uh, so now shifting to water supply. So, uh, there are many water supply options beyond damming rivers and piping waters from reservoirs to cities, right, which is kind of the status quo, large centralized systems. Um, there are many water reuse options and um, stormwater capture options. And by selecting supply sources of supply that are more flexible and dynamic, you become more resilient to a changing climate. Um, and by selecting supply sources that are lower energy intensive or can rely on renewable energy can also help mitigate climate change. So some examples here, Israel recycles um, over 80% of its wastewater, which is more than any other country in the world. Um, and that's both for urban and agricultural uses, and they 
been a, a leader in wastewater recycling. Um, similarly, um, the capital city of Vintuk in Namibia relies on recycled wastewater for about 25% of its supply, and this is a country that literally has no rivers running through it, and so they have to be very smart with their water supplies. And similarly to Singapore, they um, mix this wastewater back into their, treated wastewater back into their reservoirs, um, and so it gets treated multiple times. Uh, and then also here in the city of San Francisco, um, the city is a leader in on-site water reuse, which means the water is captured, treated, and reused all within one building system. Uh, and Salesforce Tower, which you can't see from this view, but um, is the world's first on-site black water reuse system, which means wastewater reuse all on-site. Uh, last example from Mexico City, uh, with rainwater capture. So residents are installing rain barrels to capture water that they can treat and use at home. So this is a hyper-localized solution. Uh, to water scarcity. Uh, and now I'm shifting talking about water management, right? A more, a more holistic view beyond demand and supply. Uh, so a holistic water management in cities can benefit the cities in multiple ways, and it includes innovation and new technology. And when you put a climate lens on this, what I'm talking about is for adaptation, you're managing the unavoidable, for mitigation, you're avoiding the unmanageable. And what that means is for adaptation, right, you know that there are certain climate change related risks that are already in motion, that are already going to affect our cities. So how do we manage for that and prepare our cities for those impacts? And then what avoiding the unmanageable means is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, sequestering carbon to avoid a catastrophic climate future. Uh, so some examples in the city of Wuhan, China, um, they are turning the city into a sponge city to deal with increased flooding. And so what this means is using some of those sustainable landscape practices that I talked about earlier, increasing green space, um, making parks that have rain gardens and rain barrels and allowing the city to act like a sponge and soak in some of that flood water and then slowly release it back to the rivers to prevent the city from flooding. Uh, and then a technology example in Stockholm, Sweden, um, they have installed IoT or Internet of Things remote sensors throughout their water system in order to track uh, and remotely manage their water quality. Okay, so to recap on what we've talked about so far, today we're putting more pressure on freshwater resources than ever and facing worsening water challenges. Uh, many climate change impacts manifest through water, storms, floods, and droughts. And this combination of urban population growth and climate change is putting cities at a critical nexus for water and climate resilience. Now, solving water management challenges in cities around the world is possible but will require new ways of thinking and doing. Many global cities are already providing excellent examples of innovative water management strategies, but we need faster uptake. The Pacific Institute is helping to create, scale, and connect people to innovative solutions um, and help kind of make those connections connect the dots. So to conclude, water is integral to everything we do, and there are clear and striking signs that we are not managing it sustainably. A more sustainable approach is possible, but it will require rethinking our water demand, our water supply, and water management. And lastly, it is imperative that we have a climate lens on all of these water decisions going forward and thinking about adaptation and mitigation. And of course, like any important issues, we have to act now. So thanks, and uh, now we can open up for discussion. So thank you. <laughs> a quick question. Uh, to, in California,